instead of having the recursive recent parser, we want to now use an external stack for simulation, and then we have a parsing algorithm and a parse tree, parse table, and the grammar is encoded in the tabular form. And then what we did was we started looking at how this parser works. We actually took an example, and we took an example of parse table in the grammar. Before that, we did certain transformations on the grammar. And the parse table actually is indexed by non-terminals and terminals of the language. And for each of the combinations of non-terminals and terminals, we determine what is the action to be taken, and that action is encoded in the table itself. And this is the grammar to begin with. This is the expression grammar from which we had removed the left recursion. And then, this is how the table looks for the non-recursive grammar. Okay. So what this table is saying is that I have this indexing on non-terminals and indexing on terminals. Dollar is a special symbol which sits at the end of the input string and at the bottom of the stack. And what we want to say is that if this is a symbol on top of the stack and this is my look-ahead symbol, then expand using this rule. And all the entries corresponding to these rules, they are corresponding to expansion, and all the entries corresponding to the blanks, they are the error states, which say that if this is my top of stack symbol and this is my look ahead, then input string is incorrect. You cannot do parsing from that one. Okay. And then we looked at the parsing algorithm. So, parsing algorithm was that whenever we have a situation where we can do expansion, that means Top of the stack is a non-terminal, and look-ahead symbol is obviously a terminal. Then I'll expand this rule. And when I say I expand by this rule, what that means is that I'm going to pop this symbol from the stack, and I'm going to push the right, right hand side of the rule in the reverse order on the stack. Okay? And whenever top of stack is going to be a terminal symbol, and it matches the input symbol, then I'm going to advance the input by one, and I'm going to discard what is in the top of the stack, and if both bottom of the stack and the look-ahead symbol, they are dollar, then we stop saying that this string has been accepted, otherwise this is an error string. So this is what my parsing does, that we match top of the stack, if it is dollar, then we halt, if it is terminal, then we pop and increment input pointer by one, and if it is non-terminal, then I must expand by a rule, and when I expand by this rule, what that means is, I'm popping x from the stack, and I'm pushing u, v, w in reverse order on the stack. And otherwise, I'm going to go into an error state. So this is what we were discussing in the previous class. And then we took an example of saying that if this is my initial condition, and this is the string I'm trying to pass, then how do I go about doing it? And we go about doing it by saying that my initial condition is dollar is sitting at the bottom of the stack. Then this is the start symbol, and this is a string to be passed, which is ended with a dollar. And when I say that top of stack is E, and my look ahead is ID, then I go and look at. So let me take this pass table, and then we look at EID, which says pop E from the stack and push TE prime in the reverse order from the stack. Okay. So those of you who missed this part, please go back and study this part, and what we are going to do now is that once we know what the algorithm is, then we want to construct. So we went through this example completely, and we finally reached a state where we came to a hot state, where top of stack was dollar, input is dollar, and we said that this is where the part terminates. Okay? So next <coughs> task in front of us is that now we want to construct the parse table. So there are two parts, so let me go back to the parser once again. And here we said that this is a parser, we have discussed this algorithm, and this parse table, which is encoding of this grammar into a tabular form like this, okay. this is what we want to understand now, that how we are going to take this grammar and convert this into a table. Is, is it making sense, or do you want me to take another extra class and repeat everything what we did in the previous class? Okay. So we'll then move on from this part. Okay. So what we want to do now is let's take this grammar, okay, which is this grammar, and then see how do I convert this grammar into a tabular form. So this is my grammar which I'll keep using. So let me just write it. 
as I go through this set of slides. So E prime is going to plus E prime for epsilon, and then <coughs> T is going to E prime, and E prime is going to star E prime or epsilon, and F is going to bracketed expression of I. This is what my grammar is. Okay? And what we will start doing is we will start analyzing this grammar and then we will come to somehow see that this grammar can be actually rewritten into a form like this which will help me doing the part. That is the task which is immediately in front of us. Okay? So how do we start doing it? So first thing we started looking at was we said we are going to define what we know as a set of first symbols. Okay? Now I am also going to define another set of symbols which I will call as follow symbols. Okay. And then I will define how do I compute first and follow sets. But basically, what this means is that if I say that there is some start symbol, which is S, which is deriving W, which is a string in my language, and then some other symbol, let's say A, which is a non-terminal, which derives this part of the string. Okay. Now I say that since A derives this, this symbol, and obviously this is a string of terminals. Let me say that the first symbol that can occur in any derivation, starting from A, that I am going to call as the first symbol, and whatever is the symbol which can come into a string which is, or which come immediately after the string which is derived from A, that I am going to call as follow symbol. And what we need to do is, we need to compute for all the non-terminals here, the first and the follow sets. Right? And once I compute this, then I will show you that using that information, how I am going to put this information in a tabular form so that I can then do parsing from that point on. Okay? So that is the task in front of us. How do we compute first set and how do we compute follow sets? So let's start by computing the first sets. So I'll keep this definition in front of you, and then slowly I will try to develop the algorithm for this. Okay. Now this says that if I start any derivation from a non-terminal, then let me just find out what are the possible sets of, or what is the possible set of terminal symbols which can come. Okay. So let's look at this. If I start a derivation from E, then what are the possible terminal symbols which can come into a string which can be derived from E? Now, how many rules do I have for E? Only one rule, which says E goes to T E prime. That means if I am trying to compute first of E, then since T comes in the beginning, it must be same as first of T. It cannot be anything else. Okay? And therefore, we say that this is first of T. And if I now look at productions of T, okay, there is only one production corresponding to T, which says T goes to F T prime. Okay? Which means that any string which can be derived from T must start from something which is in first of F. It cannot be anything else. And therefore, we say that this is going to be same as first of F. And then, if I look at first of F, what are the terminal symbols which can come in the beginning of any derivation starting from F? Left parenthesis and ID. These are the only two symbols which can come into any string which can be derived from F. Okay? So therefore, I say that this is nothing but left parenthesis and I. So first of E, first of T, and first of F, they are the same, and this is the same. <coughs> right? Okay. Now what about first of E prime? So I am doing this computation for all the non-terminals in my ground. Okay. So if I say first of T prime, sorry, so let me first compute first of E prime, let me go in that order. So if I look at first of E prime, how many productions do I have for E prime? Two, Two productions. So this says E prime goes to plus T prime, or this says E prime goes to F prime. Right? So what are the symbols which can come into any string which can be derived from E prime? Plus? Or plus of any other. So basically, this is nothing but plus and epsilon. Okay? Now this I will discuss in little more detail. Okay? Because how do I get epsilon here? This is slightly tricky. Okay? What this means is that 
e can e prime can derive epsilon. Okay. So the way to interpret this is that e prime. When I say that e prime plus is in the first of e prime, what that means is that if I start deriving from strings which start with e prime, then string must begin with plus, but e prime can also derive epsilon. Okay. Now when I say it can derive epsilon, I have to look now slightly more generally. So suppose I say I have a situation like this which says a1 goes to x1, x2 up to say xn. And I am trying to compute first of a. Now what is first of a? <coughs> what is first of a? First of x1. So now you have already got it, right? So it is first of x1, but if x1 derives epsilon, suppose I have a production of this form, it says x1 derives epsilon, okay? Then it is possible that in some derivation, I can say a derives x1, x2 up to this, and then I say x1 derives epsilon, and then anything which is beginning with x2 can also be part of this, okay? So therefore, we don't say that first of a is equal to first of x1, but what we say is, First of x1, first of a contains, first of x1, except epsilon. Okay. But if first of x1 contains epsilon, which means I have this production, then it also contains, so I will now take a union, it contains first of x2. And now it is possible that I have a production of this form. It says x2 also goes to epsilon. That is possible. Okay. So then I'll say this contains first of x2 except epsilon. And I'll keep on doing this. Okay. And if all of first of x1, first of x2, and first of xn, all of them contain epsilon in the first symbol, then I'll say that a can therefore derive epsilon, and therefore epsilon is also contained in of it. Yeah? So this is the logic I am using here that first of E prime contains plus and epsilon and if I now look at first of T prime, what is first of T prime? Star and epsilon, right? I have only two productions, T prime going to star F T prime and T prime going to epsilon. So now it will be, so this is what my first sets are for all the non-terminals in the language. Right? Now let's get on to computation of the follow sets. So let me keep this figure because that is going to give you some hints of how I'm going through the computation of the follow set. So suppose S is my start symbol, okay? and I say that S is deriving any string in the language I have. Okay? So W is any string in the language which can be derived from S, S is the start symbol in my grammar. Then what is containing follow of S? Look at this figure. Okay? Now, what are the symbols which can follow W? Because that will be follow of S. I introduced a special symbol, remember? So dollar always is in follow of S. That's why we introduced dollar, we don't want to worry about end of string and so on. Okay? And we are saying that always we are saying by putting a special symbol here, dollar is in follow of S. That's the first definition. That's the first initiation or first initialization you have. Okay. So always take the start symbol of your grammar and say that dollar is in follow of that start symbol. Okay. And remember that since you are doing the top down parsing, we will start from top down and keep on computing all these follow sets. Okay. Now let me look at patterns. Okay. So my first rule is dollar is in follow of now suppose I have a pattern like this, A goes to
Suppose I have a pattern like this. Okay. And I want to compute the follow of B. Then what is follow of B? Follow of B contains beta. Follow of B contains <coughs> beta. No. Beta is a string of terminals and non terminals. It contains first of beta. Right? So follow of B. So first thing we are saying is that follow of B contains first of beta except epsilon. See in follow sets, epsilon is trivial, right? I mean after any symbol you can just put an epsilon there and say this is in follow of. So I can trivially put any number of epsilons and therefore you will notice that follow sets actually don't contain epsilon. The first which contains epsilon because it can derive epsilon, right? So if I have a pattern like this, then I'll say follow of B contains first of beta except epsilon. Right? Everyone agrees with this? Everyone is comfortable with this? Okay. Next two, next pattern. It was just brought out. If I have a pattern like this and beta derives epsilon. Okay. Then, then what will happen? I will now say that follow of B contains whatever is in follow of B. And I can have only one more pattern and that pattern is if I say A goes to alpha b, where b is a non terminal okay. Then again, the same rule will apply and I will say that follow of b contains everything in follow of a. And follow of a also contains follow of b. We are going top down, remember. So it is a which is deriving alpha b, right? So my pattern is something like this. <coughs> a derives alpha b. And this is, therefore, this was my initialization. So I started with the start symbol, and then I'm going down in the tree. So why do follow of A will contain follow of B? From the context. So B can derive from A. B can derive from A. Okay. So follow of B contains. Can you think of any other pattern? So actually, I have taken care of all the pattern where non-terminal occurs at the end, non-terminal occurs in the middle, where epsilon is not followed by that non-terminal, or non-terminal occurs in the middle, and epsilon is followed by this non-terminal. There is no other pattern I can think of. Right? So using this, and exactly what I am writing here is derived from just this figure. If you can conceptually understand what this figure is saying, then these rules are nothing but just the conversion of what we are seeing in this figure. So now a trick. And the trick is that if you see rule number 3 and rule number 4, here I am defining follow in terms of follow. And therefore, what may happen is that I compute one follow set and then I look at another rule which again is going to change the follow set. Right? This is a recursive definition. So what may happen is that if I keep on computing this, I must recompute it again because it is possible that depending upon the order of the rules I pick up, okay, these follow sets can change <coughs> and I must recompute follow sets using rule number 3 and 4 so long as I cannot really add anything new. Okay? But can I go into infinite loop because of this? I, I can keep on computing and I never stop. Is that possible? 
Yes, no. So look at this context. Every time what I'm what is it that I'm doing? I'm adding something, right? I'm never removing anything from the policy. I'm only adding. And then if I add something, and how many non how many terminal symbols I can have in my grammar? Is that known? There's an upper bound on that. Right? So is it monotonic function? So if it is monotonic, then you know that it will converge. Okay? So I don't have to worry about saying that I can keep on computing this and I may never terminate. Okay? So either I'm adding something or I'm keeping it constant. But since I know if I keep on adding, I can only reach the maximum number of non-terminals and therefore I have to stop there. Okay? So let's compute now follow sets of same grammar and let's compute the follow sets. Okay? Uh, let me do one thing. Let me remove this screen and let me just do the computation for the same grammar and then construct the pass table right away. Because once I compute first and follow sets, then converting this into a pass table is straightforward. So let me write all the symbols here. And the symbols are E, E prime, T, C prime left. And if I apply rule number one, so I'm what I'm going to do is I've written the four rules here, and I keep on applying them again and again. So if I apply the first rule, first rule says E is my start symbol, and therefore dollar is in follow of That is what my first rule is saying. Nothing. Okay. Second rule says now look at patterns where a non-terminal occurs somewhere in the middle. Okay. So I am now looking at this pattern where I say that T occurs somewhere, it has a symbol which is on the right hand side and using this rule when I apply rule number 2, I will say that everything in first of E prime except epsilon is in follow of T. Right? That is what this rule says. So let us look at first of E prime which I have already computed here which is plus and epsilon. So follow of T will contain plus. Remember everything except that sign. Okay. What about this? Here there is again a non-terminal. Okay. But this pattern is same so it is not going to add anything. Okay. Now what about this? I will say that follow of f contains everything in first of t prime except epsilon. Now what is first of t prime? First of t prime is star epsilon. So follow of f will contain star. Okay. And this pattern does not give me anything new, this is the same pattern and what about this, follow of E will contain right parenthesis. So follow of E will also contain right parenthesis. Clear? Okay. Now let us apply the third rule and third rule says, so just mechanically go about applying these rules okay. and third rule says that look for patterns where B occurs or a non-terminal occurs somewhere in the middle, but the right hand side of the non-terminal is epsilon. Okay? So if I apply the third rule, this says <coughs> this one, this pattern, okay, this says E prime goes to epsilon. So first of follow of T will contain everything in follow of E. Okay? So follow of T will contain everything in follow of E, which is dollar and right parenthesis. Okay? I have already computed follow of E. And that is where you see the problem starts coming, that I will have to go over and over again, because one follow is defined in terms of another follow. Okay. And if I look at this, this says follow of t because e prime derives epsilon, therefore follow of t will contain everything in follow of e prime. So follow of t will contain everything in follow of e prime, which is empty so far, so it does not get anything added. What about this? This says follow of f will contain everything in follow of t because t prime is deriving epsilon, so what is follow of t? Yes. Plus dollar right parenthesis, right? So follow of f will contain plus dollar right parenthesis, okay? And what about this one? This one says because t prime derives epsilon, therefore follow of f will contain everything in follow of t prime, which does not add anything, okay? What about this? Can I apply this rule on this pattern? No, no right? Because this is not null. Okay. What about this? This is not a non-terminal, so I stop. 
Now I apply rule number four. And in rule number four, I am looking at patterns where I say that a non-terminal is in the rightmost position. Right? So here is a non-terminal which is in rightmost position. So fall of E prime will contain everything fall of E. Right? So this will be dollar right parenthesis. Okay? And here it says fall of E prime contains everything in fall of E prime, which is trivial. Fall of T prime contains everything in fall of T. So this will contain now plus dollar right parenthesis. Okay? And this one says fall of T prime contains fall of T prime, doesn't add anything. Here I don't have any non-terminal on the right position. So I stop. Okay? Now this rule, number three and four, have to be applied again and again. To read them, okay. Till I know that I cannot add anything more to the set. So, is application of the rules clear? What we are doing here? Okay. Now, let me simultaneously start making the part table. Okay. So, my past table remember that it was indexed by the symbols which were E. E prime, T, T prime, and F, which were my non terminal symbols. And then it was also indexed by all the terminal symbols. Okay? So, what are my terminal symbols? Terminal symbols in this case are ID plus star, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, and dollar, which is something I have introduced. Right? So, I have plus star, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, ID, and then <coughs> dollar. So now what we say is that because we are saying that E goes to ID. Okay? Now what that means is really that look at all possible patterns, look at all possible rules. <coughs> and if I have a rule like this which says A goes to alpha, okay, then what this means is that if I now have a table and I look at A and first of alpha, so I am looking at, for corresponding to this rule, I am looking at an entry in the table which corresponds to this non-terminal and anything first of alpha. What will that be? What should be the entry in the table corresponding to this entry? saying here is that what is the entry corresponding to? This is saying that if I, this is top of my stack and this is the look ahead symbol, then what should I do? Derive using this particular rule. Right? So corresponding to this entry in the parse table, corresponding to this non-terminal and for all first of alpha, except epsilon, use this rule for derivation. Okay? So when I start using this rule, what it says is, that if I look at first of E, first of E contains left parenthesis and ID, right? So E goes to T E prime is the rule here because all I am saying is that corresponding to this and left parenthesis, this is the rule I have. Okay? Now this is also telling you something very interesting. And that interesting thing is that all valid strings in this language must start either from id or from left parenthesis. They cannot start from either plus or multiplication or right parenthesis. That will be one. Right? What about e prime? Okay. e prime says that all valid strings which can be derived from e prime must start with plus. Okay. So forget about epsilon production for the time. Okay. So this says that if I now look at first of this, that is plus. So E prime and plus is going to give me a rule which says E prime goes to plus T E prime. Okay. What about this rule? This says T goes to F T prime. And what is first of F? First of F is left parenthesis and ID. So corresponding to T, I will say that T ID is going to T goes to F T prime and that parenthesis is here, so this says t goes to f t prime. Right? Now, 
what about this rule? This says t prime goes to star f t prime. That means whenever I see star and this is the non-terminal, then I can use this rule. So this says t prime and star is here. So this says t prime goes to star f t prime. So just align this. This is roughly here. This corresponds to plus. This corresponds to left well. And if I look at this rule, which says f goes to bracketed expression, then what do I do? What rule do I use? And what is the entry I am making here? So corresponding to f and left parenthesis, I will say f goes to bracketed expression. And corresponding to fid, I say f goes to i. So just by looking at the first set, okay, I can make these entries in my past table. I don't have to do anything else. Is this clear? Okay. Now let's come to epsilon productions. Now it says that somewhere E prime goes to epsilon. Now I don't have any entry because there's a rule. Okay. Possibly there will be an entry corresponding to E prime going to epsilon. Now, what are the situations under which? So, conceptually, now visualize okay, that. So, I'm not giving you algorithm. Algorithm I can describe much later. Okay. Conceptually, if you can understand, that will be much clearer, right? So, what are the situations under which e prime goes to an epsilon? So, look at a situation like this. Again, from the derivation point of view, that if I say somewhere a goes to, so let me re slightly redraw this figure, a little more space. So somewhere I have a situation like this. A goes to, let's say, uh, some alpha and let's say E prime, and then E prime goes to epsilon, and alpha is some. Okay. What are the situations under which I will use this production which says that E prime goes to epsilon? When you know the production is working. That's too vague. <laughs> Because when you say no other production is working, what that means is that I can make those entries only when I'm passing the string. But I make pass table before I start the parser, before I start the processing of pass. So E prime never goes to ID. E prime can never go to ID. There's no rule, right? So e prime can either go to ID, this. If I encounter ID and the terminal symbol is E prime, non terminal symbol is E prime, then I'll use epsilon. But in input I'll see only terminal symbols. I never see any. Oops. Non-terminal in No, I am at E prime and I saw ID. Mm -hmm. Then I use E prime goes to. But that's an error. You said something. Yeah. What What are you saying? So when I see a symbol in follow of E prime, then I know that I can just throw E prime, reduce it to epsilon, because that's a valid entry, right? Remember that I talked about sequential forms. I am saying that. What are the possible, all possible derivations which can happen from this, right? So I must all the time have valid sentential forms. So therefore, in any valid sentential form, I am capturing this information either by first or follow sets. Okay? So now I'm saying that in case E prime goes to epsilon, then look at follow set of E prime. And in that entry, so I say that if I have an entry like this, a prime going to or a going to epsilon, then look at entry corresponding to this and follow off A. And that entry is going to be Can you see this? What is happening here? So this is all I need to do. That's how I computed follow sets. Okay? So now if I see that I have a production which says E prime goes to epsilon, let me look at what is the follow set of E prime. And if I say follow set of E prime is dollar, like parenthesis, then I say corresponding to this, E prime goes to epsilon and E prime goes to epsilon. Because these are the two symbols which are in follow of E prime. Okay? Similarly, I will say I have a production which says T prime goes to epsilon. So I look at follow set of t prime, right? 
and I say that corresponding to plus, so where is d prime corresponding to plus, I will say d prime going to epsilon corresponding to right parenthesis d prime going to epsilon and corresponding to right parenthesis uh, corresponding to dollar d prime going to epsilon. Say I did not take you through next level of application of 3 and 4, I mean that you can do. Okay. But basically, this is the logic I use for construction of the pass table. And this is really what I have done. I started with this grammar, then I computed my first sets, I compute my follow sets, and I encode this first and follow information. This tells you all the sentence forms which can come in this language, and the rest of it can be just tagged as an error state. So anything else, we'll say that this is not a valid and crucial form, and therefore should be discarded, should be flagged as an error. <coughs> clear? Questions? Anything? <coughs> if something is not clear, ask me now. So just by pre-processing this information, computing first and follow sets, okay, and everything comes from just this figure. Really, there is nothing else. If you can just remember this, that I deriving this particular string and part of it derives from A, and here is first and here is follow, then everything can be just visualized and everything can be encoded from this. Now let me come to a different situation. Now suppose you encounter a situation where somewhere, so let's take this particular cell. Okay. Now you encounter a situation where you say that top of my stack is E prime, my input is star, what do I do? So what, what does that mean? It's an error, right? Still flag an error. But then what will you do beyond that? Will you stop process of parsing and say your input is incorrect or will you do something more? You said recover, right? So we were saying that at some point of time, it's not sufficient to say that I have an error, but it is what is required is that I should recover from that error and should do more parsing and find more and more error. Now what does recovery mean? So what I'm, I've got into a situation where I say that my input is, let's say star, and my top of stack is, <coughs> Uh, e prime, okay, this is my input pointer, this is my stack pointer, and parser says I have reached an error state, right? So how will parser continue from here? It has reached an error state, but how do I continue? I can continue only by, if I reach one of these entries. Now how can I reach one of these entries? I must manipulate my stack and input to reach one of these entries. So how, how do I manipulate? So first attempt, okay. Suppose I say I know that this input is incorrect. So look at this. Suppose I'm trying to parse, uh, clear up a little more space. Suppose I'm trying to parse id plus star id. Now I'm, I'll not try to guess the intention of the user. I'll not try to guess. Because I already know this is incorrect, okay? And by guessing, I may create more mess. But I want to flag more and more errors. There's no guarantee that I'll be able to give all right errors. But suppose I say ID has been consumed, plus has been consumed, then I see star here. What I was expecting was something else. I could either have got an ID here, or I could have got a left parenthesis here. Nothing else was valid, okay? So if I discard this input, and I reach this, can I continue parsing? I can, right? So what is the general principle therefore? What are the symbols I must discard? Till you hit a symbol which is in first of E prime. So if I say that my top of stack is E prime, and I have reached an error state, I say st start discarding symbols, till you hit a symbol which is in first of the non-terminal which is on top of stack, and then I'll find an entry corresponding to that in the parse table, and hopefully I'll be able to continue parsing from there. That is one step. So is that recovery? By discarding part of the input, I can continue parsing. So another way, so if I pick up an example from programming languages,
So suppose I have statement one followed by semicolon, statement two followed by semicolon, statement three, statement four. Okay. Now suppose, or let me say, there is a semicolon here, but let's say this statement was something like this. Okay. And I found that something is missing here. Okay. Then one way to look at this is let me discard this input. Okay. And when I hit here, okay, then hopefully I'll be able to continue parsing from that one. Okay. Now remember that when we talk of error recovery, there is no hard and fast tool which will say that I'll be able to recover from this error because it is possible that in way of recovery I may actually discard more errors. Okay. And in some situation, worst cases, I may reach the end of the program. Okay. But this strategy is telling me that at least there is a hope that I'll be able to recover from this and continue parsing. Okay. So first strategy we use is that if top of stack symbol is A, then discard input till I hit something which is in first of A, and then try to continue parsing from there. That is one. Or can somebody suggest me one more strategy at least? So another strategy is continue discarding input till you hit a symbol which is in follow of A, and then pop A, and try to continue parsing from there. So these are the two strategies which are used, and this is also known as panic mode error recovery, where we say that I will either discard some symbols. Now, can I keep that as part of my parse table? What are the symbols? Because I know the first and follow sets, right? So I can always compute that if I'm using now follow sets, okay, I can say I know follow of E, and what are the symbols which are in follow of E? Follow of E contains right parenthesis here and dollar. So let me say I call that as a sync symbol. So I'm saying if I get into error state, then I can sync on this. And syncing on this means that keep looking for symbol which is in the sync set, then pop this symbol and continue passing from there. Works? Okay. So these are the two strategies which are commonly used. The other strategies people have worked on, so there is a lot of literature which may be available. If you see, where you will find that people will try to guess intent of the user and will try to correct. But that's really the dangerous area. And not many compilers try to do that. Okay? And therefore, the common error recovery mode that is used is that first you try to find a symbol which is in first off top of stack, discard everything up to that symbol from the input, try to continue parsing. And the second strategy is look for a symbol which is in follow of what is on top of stack, pop this symbol and try to continue parsing from there. So that is all about top down parse. So now we know how the parser works. Now we know how to take a grammar, modify the grammar to remove all kind of recursion from that, convert that into a parse table, and how to do error recovery. What more do we want? There is nothing else really in top down parse. Okay. So let me now quickly take you through <coughs> the slides I sort of discarded, uh, and uh, then. So in the slides you will find the same thing what we have discussed here, okay? and I'll just take you through that. Okay? So it will give you a little more structure than what I was discussing on the board. All right. So first I compute first sets. So we say that x is a terminal. If it's a terminal symbol, then first of x is value x and if there's a production of this form then we say epsilon is in first of x and if I have a situation which says x goes to y1 to yk and each of y1 is yi is included in first of x except epsilon and if all of the yi's contain epsilon then we say that first of x also contains epsilon. Okay, so this is what we did in the computation of first set and this is what I just computed that first of e, t and f is left parenthesis and id and first of E prime and first of T prime are these sets. Okay? And then we computed follow sets. So we said dollar is in follow of S, which is the start symbol. And then I looked at various patterns, which says A goes to alpha B beta, A goes to alpha beta, and A goes to alpha B beta, where first of beta contains epsilon. And then we computed follow sets. And the same for the same grammar, okay? there is the follow set we come out with. Okay? 
and once we have these follow sets, we construct parse table and what do we say that? For all rules of this form A goes to alpha, we say that if A is in first of alpha, okay, then I am going to include it here and for all symbols, if epsilon is in first of A, then I am going to use B here which is in follow of A set. Right? Okay? And any grammar which has a parse table without any multiple entries <coughs> is also called LL1 grammar. So in this case, my look ahead is one. Okay, so this is another test which is used that you actually construct a parse table and see whether you have multiple entries. Okay? For some grammars, you will not be able to construct a parse table with only single entries in each cell. Okay? So a grammar whose parse table has no multiple entries is also known as LL1. And these are the various <coughs> parser generators which are available to us, which are top-down parsers. Antler is one very popular parser, but then there is LLGen, LLNextGen, and then you can search literature <coughs> on that. So there is something called a tiny parser generator, Y parser generator, SLK, and so on. Okay, so these are all top-down parsers which are available to us. Error handling, okay. Uh, if we stop at the first error and just give an error message, that may be very friendly to us as compiler writer, but definitely is not something which is desirable from the user's point of view. So we must do error recovery, and <coughs> every compiler actually recovers from errors and tries to identify as many as possible. Okay? So panic mode, so I'll straight away take you to what I discussed. You can read the rest of it. There are many methods of doing error recovery. So nobody actually will try to do correction except some compilers where you say that anything can be compiled, like PLC had a compiler, where they were saying doesn't matter what you write, they will try to always compile it by guessing your intentions. It was not very successful. So error recovery, the way it works in LL1 parts that we have just discussed, errors occur when you have a parse table entry, which is empty, and so a skip symbols in the input until you see a selected uh, set of tokens which is in sync set, okay? And what are these tokens? I can either place symbols which are in follow of A in the sync set, then skip <coughs> terminals until you see something in follow of A, pop A and continue parsing from there, or add symbols which are in first of A in the sync set, and then it is possible to resume parsing according to A if you can then skip symbols till you hit something which is in first of A. Right? So this is where we are going to stop today, and in the next class we are going to start bottom of class.